I work for the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the program Orange College, which is an initiative of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, not only in South Africa, but also in Mozambique, in Angola, in Morocco, in Sudan, and soon in many more countries. What is the whole idea? Please join us. The whole idea behind what we do is we, we want to empower local ecosystem by joining forces with them and not implement initiative number 125, but we want to join forces with existing initiatives. That's why we have brought all our program managers from the different countries here as well, so that they can be exposed to the role of entrepreneurship. And, and after being in 29 countries in Africa, and soon also many in the Middle East, though, um, we wanted to talk about what is the role of the donors and the international community in building those ecosystems. Because needless to say, is that um, they have a very important role to play. And this role is so important because in some of the countries they are the biggest enablers. They are the ones that actually make that point be on the agenda, on the political agenda. So we know that majority of the countries in Africa, having a youth population accounting for more than 60%, are unable to absorb the youth into their official job markets. So the thing is that the, the private sector is not able to absorb as well the majority of the youth. So what is the role that international donors can play in those ecosystems? Just some small figures, and of course join the discussion if you want to online. Um, the figures are as follows. The, um, not only the youth population is very high, but it was also seen that in 2017 we had 111 hubs in Africa, and in 2018 we had 382. So guess what? There's a very good business model behind it. They're mushrooming everywhere. I've been to countries five years ago, there was nothing. And I've been in the same country three years later, there are like five or six or seven glorified Wi-Fi spaces, as I like to call majority of those incubators. So today we have our project manager, and I will let them introduce themselves in, let's say, a minute. But I will ask, I will ask our special guest of honor, Joe, who is from the African Development Bank, to quickly present yourself like I am, I do, and I envision. Um, my name is Josephine Dow, so I work for the African Development Bank. I'm doing an initiative called Jobs for Youth in Africa. And the initiative aims to create 25 million jobs over 10 years, direct and indirect jobs. And um, two, with two ways of doing it, looking at skills development and skills enhancement and entrepreneurship development. So I manage um, a lot of the work that has to do with entrepreneurship and SME development. What I envision is um, the ability for in Africa, in school, out of school, to know that they have two choices. It's not just about being an employee, but they can be employed and they can actually create jobs for their families as well. Cool. Thank you very much. Joanna. Hi, my name is uh, Joanna. Joanna, you have to speak like a rapper. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joanna. Um, I work for the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Angola. Um, I'm on the Orange Corners team. Um, and my vision is that we empower the youth um, in Angola to embrace the futures and thrive in the market. Hello everyone, my name is Bontes. I'm the managing director of 249 Startups. I'm also the project manager of Orange Corner Sudan. Uh, we work uh, 249 Startups, uh, we try to build the perfect environment for startups and entrepreneurs in Sudan. And our vision to build a world class uh, community that supports the startups and entrepreneurs in Sudan. Hi, my name is Ismail Smaro, so I'm working for ESP, Entrepreneurial Association Partners, who aim to foster prosperity in uh, our economy through entrepreneurship and sector private, private sector development. So you come and English, my fresh English. So, yeah, I'm leading the, the incubation practice in the West Africa, so we aim to foster development through the young uh, entrepreneurs. So, the work I'm doing, we uh, uh, Orange Corner, where I'm serving as a program manager. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adeli Kadiemi. I head uh, a non-profit in Nigeria called Faith Foundation. Faith is a 19-year-old non-profit uh, with a mission to foster wealth creation. 
by supporting young and aspiring entrepreneurs to start their at scale businesses. Uh, we understand that there's a strong ecosystem support required for entrepreneurs to do that. And so we provide direct capacity building and enablement, enablement and then also link our entrepreneurs with partners who can help them along with their journey. Uh, we also do quite a lot also in enabling the business environment too. And we're the newest already called our partner. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yuri Maria, I'm the Action Catalyst for IGL Lab. Uh, a company that acts as a catalyst of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Mozambique. So we do not like to be a country where everyone uh, has the power to give this first step and actually make a difference. As Orange Corner as community manager, um, we say that Orange Corner we need to be changing the narrative of young entrepreneurs in Mozambique, giving them a hope that Thank you very much, uh, everybody. As you can see in the program of the GEC, there is one big thing missing for me there. That's the African content and the African content. And the African content is actually here because Niger is here, Sudan is here, Mozambique is here. I've seen a lot of my friends, brothers and sisters from all over the country being here. But when it comes kind of about discussions about their ecosystem, this is lacking. And this is not part of the agenda. And I urge everybody that is here involved in the GEC to make sure that next one will have Africa on the priority of this agenda. Now how does we work how do we work as Orange Corners? We use our ambassadors as brokers. So we want to add to the sustainability of the program by telling them we will not pay for your information. But what we will do is we'll use the ambassador to talk to important people such as Rachel Fury, um, who has a big foundation um, in South Africa, SAP Miller. And we, we go to those people and we tell them, well, we've identified these five hubs that we would love to work with them, but we don't want to pay for ourselves. We believe that the local private sector should cover the cost of their integration program. And this is what we've done so far, and 83, 85 percent of our costs are covered by the local private sector. This is going to be an interactive discussion, and of talking from my side. So, this is us, this is them, we've seen them, yeah. all change agents in their own environment. So, this is going to be very interactive. So from the panel, I'll ask three to four people to respond in one part for every statement. And then, here's what? You're all here, that means to me that you're interested. So I will ask each and every one of you, without pulling your hand, what's your opinion about it. Okay? So don't feel afraid, don't feel afraid, I don't buy it. I just want to hear from you as well. So let's start with Adelika. What is the role of donors in your ecosystem? And what do you think in the general? One, one and a half minutes. So I've learned from technology, and um, what is the general way of business to us to be able to do that? Um, where I think that donors are, I sometimes have a problem with what is not, because I'm the patient that needs to actually actually be something. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is better? Yeah. Okay. So um, I look at donors, or the role I think donors should play will be partners. They'll be partners in supporting and in enabling um, the space and the people working within the space to, 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 to add value in different ways. Because if a donor comes and then maybe whether, so when a donor comes in, usually the perception is that there is a financial support that they're bringing into the space, or technical or resource support. But the other understanding is that the existing subjects are not in the space, and if the people in the space that should have a better knowledge of what's happening in the space, and then the donor is coming as a partner to support an existing platform uh, or existing platform that are in the space. So that's the conception of the way. So what is the definition of a donor and the approach for the issue for the world around the partners and working together to both create solutions uh, to determine the outcome that is wanted or is required. You want to ask for me or you want to ask me? Okay. So, what is the role of a donor in your ecosystem and what do you think it should be? Should they be called donor or international community? Uh, in Mozambique, we actually call donors the uh, development agencies. Uh, we consider them uh, embassies, uh, NGOs, 
Thank you very much. I will go to the audience now before I come back to you, okay? So, I will sit over here. Set up genome. When I see your map, and I put you on the spot, there is nothing in Africa except for South Africa. Why? It's not like I'm trying, or like... <laughs> We have not yet been able. Um, can you hear me now? No, it's like I'm assuming. Uh, we, have, we have not successfully recruited members in Africa. Uh, we have not found a match between uh, desire. There's lots of desire and, and demand. We have not found a match between that demand and desire and the resources uh, to support it. Uh, but, but we think we could. Uh, I mean, it's gonna sound, I'm biased, but we think we could be helpful and constructive in, in the ecosystem. So I'll see you next year by presenting one country. Okay, cool. And now answer the question, what do you think? True. That's, well, well, that's something that we can work on. Right? Let's, let's talk. But what do you think is the role of donors in the ecosystem or in the international community from your experience? And now I'll start. So, um, I've had experience with the role of donors in uh, many different printing contexts, uh, across many different continents, uh, different types of countries. And I think there's one caution uh, and one uh, positive. One caution is to avoid donors uh, taking over the ecosystem or somehow distorting the ecosystem or pushing entrepreneurs. Because the, entrepreneur, the entrepreneurial energy does not need to be created. It's, it's there. People are entrepreneurial everywhere. That's not the role of the donors. The donors need to avoid distorting it, uh, you know, uh, propping up institutions that aren't responding to entrepreneurs. On the positive side, it can certainly help catalyze and fill those gaps where the market is going and the government So where are those gaps in the public and private sectors? You're running ahead. Um, Sudan. Did you know that Motas has seen three presidents in one weekend? <laughs> Did you know that? I think they deserve an applause, okay? Yeah. Don't you think so? Motas. In a country that has just been really liberalized by sanctions, I think it was December last year, right? Um, what is the role of the international community in your ecosystem? Uh, so for me, uh, in Sudan specifically, uh, in general, when it comes to donors, when everyone's asking, uh, look at the Hawaja, we will call, we call people Hawaja, white Hawaja. people Hawaja. So when you look at the Hawaii, you look at the dollars only. So everyone looks at the donors as the source of money and source of funding. Uh, and support and financial support. So for me, I, I don't think this is the role of the donors. And uh, unfortunately, I think the donors also started to feel that their role is only with the financial support. So everyone is dealing with them because they want their money and he wants to get some of their uh, cake, I, I think. So for me, I think the donors could play a very important role in strengthening the ecosystem of each country because they could bring uh, technical expertise, they could sort of build the capacity of the local teams and they could strengthen the ecosystem. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think that they are currently playing that role. I think they are now competing, they are now either destroying the, some of the ecosystems by uh, doing or replicating models and doing different, the same program in different ways and providing the same support. So, for example, if you look at the report, you find like there is $30 million spent in that area. And you look at the area, it's like nothing is happening there. And you look at the reports, you find that this money has been spent in that area. But what happened? It's all either in admin and finance or uh, in the reporting or the other stuff. But nothing really happens and no change happened by the donors in that area. Bam! It was spot on. So, from fear and the pressure, I don't want you to feel under like pressure, okay? Um, African Development Bank, okay? There's a huge responsibility 
But before we go into that responsibility, what is the role of donors in that ecosystem? So speaking as donors, um, I think there's lots of conversations about this for you, especially in Africa when donors come in. But I think we also need to look at OECD countries in terms of how much they spend, for example, on research and development. If I take, for example, of Germany in 2015, they spent 27.5 million on research and development, which are all things that enable for entrepreneurship to take place. And that 27.5 million is twice as much as they actually spend on overseas development. And so there's a lot of role that donors have to play in terms of building the right infrastructure, making sure that the environment is enabled. And I think that's really where donors play a uh, key role in building the ecosystem, ensuring that there is the right processes for intellectual property, making sure that there's a legal regulatory framework and takes contracts for go through, but also just the basics in terms of public spending, in terms of education. If you have a skilled and educated labor force at the end of the day, which is publicly funded by government, it allows for SME to be competitive, it allows for SME to hire the right people. So I think in that regard, this is really the role of those who build that interest. Oh, I agree. Uh, yeah, I'll go over here. You knew that it was coming. To the Carlos, Angola, a country that was spoiled by oil the last years, and now they have to diversify the economy. And now entrepreneurship, of course, is a new buzzword. So, what do you think? And in a country in currently in transition, also has changed their president and all the elite that was up there. What is the role of the international community in shaping Angola's economy and the ecosystem? Uh, thank you, Theo. <laughs> uh, I believe I believe first uh, the mindset is changing because uh, we're getting influenced. We, we are really close as a country. Uh, people were not aware of what Angola had in terms of potential. And um, I, I do believe that the international community and all the movements are going to have an influence in shaping, uh, especially institutions, because we have a lack of, of support in terms of institutions. But not only that, people need more education uh, and people need the belief. So, uh, I was speaking about a, a, a word today that really changes everything, which is hope. And we need to give that people hope back uh, with solid stuff. So uh, there, is a, there is a huge role to be played in this. And you can really pay for the startup genome study. We're looking for money for that. <laughs> in an oil-rich country, the Netherlands, oil-free country, means Many. Okay. Um, ben, VC for Africa. So you've been around, obviously. You were in Mali a couple of weeks ago. Saw the pictures on your social media. Uh, Francophone, VC Summit. What do you think is the role of international donors and international communities in entrepreneurship? Uh, there's a lot. but. Part of it, I think, that there's an inclination to want to be engaging directly with the startups, uh, where I think the focus is better spent on actually investing in the infrastructure and the enabling uh, environment. So you'll find that a lot of donors will will try to uh, fund startups or try to work with entrepreneurs directly when we have uh, a growing community of professionals who are designed and built, purpose built to do this work. Um, so, yeah, there needs to be a recognition of what's already in the marketplace and then trying to understand what can we do to actually help empower and further enable their efforts. Um, and I would maybe also add, I think one thing that has been, in my view, a bit detrimental uh, is that donors have gotten rid of this thing called core funding, um, where everything has become increasingly programmatic. Um, but also, if you're trying to work with corporates, they all have an agenda and they all want to uh, achieve something with their sponsorship. Uh, when if you look at the physical hubs, uh, just having a little bit of core funding uh, would go a long way in terms of uh, improving the sustainability of the core operations and allowing these uh, 
uh, hubs to also develop their capacities in terms of BDS support, uh, acceleration, implementation support. Uh, so I would be actually, uh, 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 I would vote to bring back uh, some core funding. Okay. I think somebody in this audience sitting over there has heard your voice. Um, Richard, we know each other from South Africa. South Africa is this country that has been creating more or less also an industry with this triple B E scheme on entrepreneurship and everybody can do something about it. But do you think that this international funding schemes and everything are damaging the entrepreneurial programs? Yes or no? And why? South Africa doesn't have that many international donor um, schemes. So most of it is done by South Africans. Um, because of our environment, I think we're very fortunate in that companies are very motivated to support entrepreneurs. Um, there isn't enough support for innovators, I don't think. Um, but I, I think it is quite an enabling environment as far as I've seen. With, with other countries. Obviously, we still have many challenges and um, and uh, often the voice of the entrepreneur is not heard. You know, we have the same, same issue. But I can't really speak for international donors. Um, I think if you had one or two that I've worked with that have been very amazing in like, the social entrepreneur environment in South Africa, coming to Flanders, and, and what I really liked about the role that they played is, um, is that they funded all elements of the ecosystem. They understood what it took to develop that ecosystem and they, did, they funded it at a policy level, at a research level, at an incubator, at a network, and at a fund level. So they've actually, in many ways, created the environment for us to now work in much more easily. Thank you, Mapano. I'm coming. But I'm coming here first for my brother from, from a country where the Everett family has seven and a half kids. Okay? Uh, it's like solution for Japan that have fertility rate that is very low. Um, your country is about to open up into a world of entrepreneurship and everybody would want to fund you as an incubator and as an entrepreneurship program. Do you feel that this can damage your programs or your sustainability of your programs? Okay, thank you. I don't have six yet, but uh, it's true. In my country, most of the women have more than seven drivers in their life. I drive an incubator and uh, the first issue is that uh, entrepreneurs are uh, more that entrepreneurs uh, are is a founding So, we as a new side, what I mean, we are gathering entrepreneurs and uh, uh, empower them. The first thing that we try to empower is the soft skills, not the hard one. I'm coming. So, how to be focused on the business, how to be focused on the product. That's the first thing. Now, how is we are going to improve as a new company. It is a lot of money to have. So we need funding to have facilities. We need funding to have friends. We need funding to have members. So if we can not be this fund, all this to a program that we cannot go further with the program. So donors is very important for us. We are working with them. We are the first new thing for the incubation process. Ismail, Cote d'Ivoire is more than Abidjan, yes? Um, what does the funding from international community or donors does to your program? Uh, I think uh, you have to say that uh, it's a yes or no. Why yes? Because uh, in my country, people love free money, they don't get it, it doesn't give value to that free money. So uh, sometimes, most of the time, they have programs with limited time, so like two years, three years, so we create the situation, and then at, at the end of the day, the program is closed. So 
the only conflict is structured uh, really well the, the, the program. So that can be sustainable in maybe two years. I think the example is a lot So at the beginning, we are sure that the public sector are really important. So we could the participation of the, of, the, of the public sector to get that sustainability till the, the go through the value of that. So after two years, I think that we should be sustainable. So yes, uh, you know, uh, you know the we uh, have to choose uh, which structure we to money. So it's not to give the money to the government. The government doesn't know what is going on in the if I can ask you, um, you're in the be in between. You work for our embassy, but also on our RS corner program where we try to get a massive corporate on board. In the country that's in Angola, is there any chance that you can ask to get out of that? Um, I think the main function of a donor is to facilitate. Uh, a donor has a lot of power. Um, the thing with the donor as well is that they usually have certain conditions. If the conditions aren't appropriate, it can damage. Um, however, I think the way forward is to actually um, facilitate by choosing good programs, by choosing programs that have sustainability. So if entrepreneurs present a good program, they present a, a good business plan, I do feel that donating um, has a positive result. Um, Julio, when I came to Mozambique three years ago, I saw a ecosystem that is in infancy. It's there, the power is there, the energy is there, the community is there. The younger than you. Yeah, younger than you. Um, I feel that the international community has done something good with the Mozambican ecosystem. But I want to hear it from you. What, what has it done? Is there any case that it can happen to them? First of all, uh, I think thinking that more fun is from Donald to the system is like thinking that the internet is a bad thing. It's the youth, the youth, do that mind that makes all the difference, right? Uh, in our case specifically, uh, the Dutch Embassy has like a new role because for us, for us, we have an idea. It's the very first innovation program that is running in our country. And our country has 11 programs. So uh, it wasn't for the Dutch Embassy, we wouldn't have an innovation program uh, running at all. Can it damage it? It can damage it. This money wasn't just responsibility, and also um, with the donors, because you also have to have some sort of effort to the donors, right? They come with a certain mindset. Uh, an agenda. An agenda, of course. So the donors have to understand that if you see something exists, see the problem of food, but it's still present, um, find out you know, what are the gaps that uh, they will be more valuable. This is the most big uh, great thing was that uh, the donors have a great social capital. So it was easier for them to put up together in the same group people that otherwise would never be done. You know, so they thought something very important that uh, the donors Thank you. Um, so you wanted to make a contribution. Please, can you mention your name? Chad. I've got a lot of brothers and sisters from Chad. Mm -hmm. I want to make a point on that because... You have to speak like a rapper. Okay. I want to make a point on that because um, um, I'm working for the UN. The UN. So, in this case, especially, a donor has always an agenda. So, what he wants is to run his own, his own objective at the beginning. So, he wants also, on the other side, to have leadership, responsibility, ownership and governance. So when there is there is a weak leadership, weak governance mechanism, then the donor fund is not damaged. But if the leadership is strong, if the leadership is strong, then it becomes much more easier to find a common place and try to use that money as seed funding or whatever means we want in order to bring sustainability and bring change. So it's important from the other side also have leadership and good 
uh, government mechanism in order to use this as appropriate. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Well, we have the honor today to have the advisor for Africa of President Macron. Um, from Senegal, but he wears a friend's badge. Next time Senegal, okay? Promise. Um, what do you think? What, what would be your advice to President Macron when it comes to this? <laughs> Confidential. No, I think it's, it's very simple. I mean, uh, it's what you're doing. Uh, what you want to do together. It's super clear. You can come as a donor and say, okay, uh, that's the program for you and it's good for you. And uh, think of it uh, from, uh, from Paris or from La Haye or, you know. So we need now to go and see the actors on the field, discuss with them, because they know their program. We know that there is an entrepreneur there. We come to the entrepreneur from there. There is some needs, so we talk with them. We think they can try to find a way to figure it out and do it together. And, uh, how can they damage it? How can they protect it? You come and you do whatever you want. You have the money. So, and we have seen that I think, for 60 years. Since the independence. The program came with the donors and they implemented the program without discussion uh, with the civil society. It's really new that you involve the civil society to the decision. Usually it was the governor to the river. Unfortunately, there is a problem of leadership, there is a problem of how to, uh, to see and evaluate the problem. That's very good. By the, the, the beneficiary. So how do you get that? Think together, get together, we evaluate together, and we move forward. Thank you very much. Um, Adenika? Nigeria. When I told my friends and family, I'm going to Nigeria, they say Boko Haram. I'm like, guys, come on, come on, it's much more than that. So I've seen you know, all these donors going, coming, doing new programs and again programs and programs and programs, and trainings of trainers, and trainers of the trainers of trainers, and trainings of the trainers of trainers, of trainers, of trainers, of trainers. So what do you think about this? Can they damage it? And if yes, how? So, I think we've actually been part on different ways that damages can be done. So the way I would like to answer is uh, what might be the approach from my experience of what was. And um, I also have to say that Nigeria is a very much company, so many things happen, so many amazing things happen, and that in every country there are tons of amazing issues. So please come to the table. And I need to say that there are so many concerns in Nigeria about this one. So that's what. Number two, I'll put on the word that you have to Joanna use, which is on facilitation. Because the donor comes in and has knowledge and has network and has resources. So whether it's from the country's representative within the country, whether it's from the private sector that have youth uh, from the country within the space, and but even also that matches the that a donor will have uh, more than quite a lot of other things. So how one of the ways that I think the donor can help not be damaged is to create that facilitation role first. How do I think I can the government to even understand their perspective as opposed to our perspective of the issues that are created in the agenda of one of them. So that's number one. Number two, where are the class in the space and how can we provide institutional support to enable the environment and to our issues that have spoken around enabling the environment. Uh, because there's that guidance required and sometimes yes, I don't know the difference with working with government and all like that. But that really is where um, a lot of the problems can be resolved and really where the donor or the spouse or whatever can go a very long way, creating that institutional support that will ensure that the program, the policies and what we've got is sustainable. And then like we've also talked about facilitating relationships between the existing institutions that are providing support in the state and looking to support them, not just for the past thing, sometimes we can be used for, sometimes we can be technical, and provide, so even if you're looking at entrepreneurs, not really supporting entrepreneurs directly, but looking at how to market markets for instance, yeah. in the area that, that we need, and create inroads. 
so that yes, we do not come and fulfill the agenda, but at the end of the day, the partner of the country uh, that is in the conversation also sees the advantage uh, with that, and then the, the collaboration that leads to the results that we want. I agree with you. That brings us to the next point, which is actually something that you said, you said as well, that harmonization and identifying the gaps, and you said as well, identifying the gaps so that we can really invest in the gaps and build those institutions that can run themselves. Okay, they're not dependent. Uh, Joe, how can we do this? How can we harmonize our effort as an international community ourselves? We've got embassies all over, we've got programs all over, but how do we harmonize it? So, um, I'll try to speak at how it works at the national level, right? and then at the international level. Um, I think at the national level, you need someone from the global community to say, hey, we're replicating, it doesn't make sense. And once you have that voice, that speaks up, and then you can start looking at the working groups or coalitions. One of the things we've done at the African Development Bank is that we're realizing in fragile attention. There's a plethora of funds, people come in, they don't talk to anyone, and they just like want to come and be the neighbor. So, so over the past um, 18 months, we've been rolling out youth employment coalitions. So the coalitions, the way it works is we go into the country as African Development Bank, and we talk to the different ministries, and we do a quick mapping of who, what donors are working around youth employment and youth entrepreneurship issues, and then designate a ministry to be the coordinating body for all of the inter international community and the different donors that are in it. But it really does require at the national level for someone to stand up and say, and not be this crazy, we're not talking to each other. And then at the international level, one of the things I think is key is also to have a key vision that stands up and brings together this. One of the simple ones so far that we've seen that we think is working also is um, the World Bank has a program called Solutions for Youth Employment. And Solutions for Youth Employment is bringing in together, yes, the big donors, AFTP, Islamic Development Bank, but it's also bringing in NGOs at the same time and saying what is impactful. And off of evidence, they're able to say and build a portfolio of evidence-based programs and then use those evidence-based programs then have encouraged other donors to use those because there's the proven to have worked. One of the things also, these are people's lives and we're doing a lot of trial and error. So we need to be able to communicate and say these are programs that work, that are proven, and that are going to eliminate the bit of the error. Thank you very much. I agree with you. Rwanda has started it. Well they 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 they, they try. Will the Rwanda Development Board be the one that coordinates all the efforts and you have to go to them first if you want to do anything. Yet the Rwandan ecosystem is not able to be the top 20 of Africa. So it's not easy and I, I, we need to realize that as well. That institutional capacity is very, very important. Um, what do you think Mutas? Again, Sudan is this country where everybody's now looking at when we take that food and they're like, oh, and they're like, we need to do something. Um, how do we harmonize those efforts so that we can increase our impact in this whole field of change? So, to begin this, uh, I totally agree with what Bill said, and uh, I'm happy that he's here with us today. But uh, I think sometimes we feel like the donors do not understand the ecosystem, the different elements of the ecosystem, because like, there are other lots of elements and we find them all acting at the same as provider. They all want to do incubators. No one wants to work on the policy level or everyone wants to do everything in the ecosystem map. So sometimes we feel like uh, the donors, I don't know what's happening with them or maybe it's the local employees. And I know that it's difficult, it's the regulation that we have to work with the government and there's lots of things that are going on, but also uh, I think that they are lazy. Uh, because if they are working hard enough to communicate, if they are working hard enough to communicate their effort and share their work with other people so that people could work and benefit from their initiatives and from their effort and from their results and build on it. And, and also they could support them by building programs that strengthen their programs and their activities. So I think the key point is going to be communication, uh, communicating what you're doing and also having a focus area 
and definitely if you're not having the right person in the country that is doing the harmonization or taking the initiative of doing that, it's going to be difficult to Thank you for that. I will go on this side of the, of the room and didn't ask them. So I'll go to you, gentlemen. What's your name? You come from Nigeria as well. So what is your advice when it comes to harmonizing the efforts of the international community for entrepreneurship? You have to speak up, you have to be an entrepreneur. So, the good is that very important to Nigeria. If you come in and find your partner, if you have access to the classes, so we are actually having the class for us, but we don't even know how to do that. That's that. Now I'll ask and I'll put my colleague on the spot. Robert, you work for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Department of Sustainable Economic Development. You have a huge responsibility to make sure that this is happening so we don't waste our taxpayers' money, my money, his money, some others' money. How do we harmonize? What is your thought? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that's. One of the main reasons why we as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs support this program uh, and initiate action is Orange Corner's program uh, that much, and we're a big uh, uh, supporter and, and donor funder of it. Because through the Orange Corner's program, we get actual policy input, yeah? we get actual experiences with what's happening on the ground. Our embassies are a very relevant partner of the Orange Corner's program, so our ambassadors, our diplomats, they, they, they got exposed to, uh, to challenges on the ground and they get actually to meet the, the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs and speak to these uh, uh, women and, uh, and gentlemen who run the, the incubators uh, program. Um, at the same time, I'm a diplomat based in The Hague. I oversee a lot of, uh, some of our private sector development programs, uh, but I have yeah, we're almost a real uh, ministry, so my colleagues in this one open big state office space, they work on and are responsible for our uh, access to finance program. Uh, my colleagues at the same uh, open office space, uh, they are uh, doing our World Bank, our IFC program. My colleagues who run our uh, you know, entrepreneurship program, or our, our, our uh, employment uh, program, uh, so the AFP or with funding from our ministry, uh, they're all at the same core and we get it together and use the input with our sports to sit around the regular base together and see what's happening. It's not happening overnight, right? These, especially these multi donor programs such as Fantas the Manage are well they have their own uh, criteria I think, but at least as Dutch donor we can then give input and maybe if this works better, this works more differently. Um, so that's I think the main reason why we do it. Uh, at the end it's indeed about uh, policy changes, about working on uh, business climate changes. Um, maybe as a donor, as an OECD country, we should do this as an OECD uh, context. I know we tried a few times to work, for instance, on OECD pension guidelines on, 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 on uh, responsible blending. That's not there yet. But those are initiatives we as a donor uh, can, can, can initiate. Thank you very much. I'll go to you, gentlemen, here. What do you think? This is I can see, but for the law to harmonize the from better, stakeholder involvement is the key. If all the stakeholders are appropriately evaluated and mapped out and sorted out, then it is more easier to achieve the goals and the entire holistic mission and action. Okay, so you think that there is no ecosystem map already been done? And the gaps are there, you guys know them. So how can we get that information so that we can anticipate on that? I think that's the question. The people you want to find out, the people who are in the who understand it, and they don't know who wants to do that. When those stakeholders are able to harmonize that talk and that gap identified, it's only difficult for donors to identify those amounts to work with those people working with them. And when they are able to give you the feedback at the right time, they work with them to harmonize. But if they that they don't get the resource of the information, then there will always be a gap which is not possible to do not see the beauty of their work. Thank you. Um, I'm going to assist you from another as well. And I'm going to ask you, 
you work in Darfur and also in Khartoum, but also in the east of Sudan, where a lot of refugees are from Eritrea and Syria and some other countries as well. We've seen this. We've tasted it, we've seen it, we deal with it. Uh, and very important, we deal with it. But uh, what is your advice? Um, my advice uh, for, the, for donors is just they need to identify the gap before they start any initiative or any program in, the, the, the event in this country. And after the, after they identify the gap, they need to know what is have been done there before then so they can know the lesson and the big things. They need to start cooperation between them in the national level but also in the national level because uh, they, need to they need to know how the donors think and what is their agenda, what is their goals, and, what is, and how they, they use what is best for themselves. But also, not only the level of the donors, like the oil corner, but also the, the, the big donors, like the EU. So, so the three layers, there has to be, there is a communication, very quickly, the three layers of information so they can achieve their goals. This is my advice. Thank you. Um, and you kind of all come to you now. Um, should donors provide funds to startups? If yes, in what form? And that's very contradictory to what Ben just said. Uh, I'll start with you. Ah, wait. Taking into account that seed stage capital and early stage capital is, I wouldn't say completely absent, but almost completely absent. Nobody dares to go, you know, first class money to go beyond friends and family so that you can really prototype your thing and get your thing, get yourself out in the market, validate your product, your service. So should donors do that or not? And if yes, how? Uh, first, I think that the best way of doing it is working with us, not selling our uh, our companies, but we know how startups are operating, we know uh, the gaps there, uh, what the challenges they face every day. And finding our programs is uh, one of the best ways that donors can actually have an impact on uh, entrepreneurial startups. Uh, second, if the donors want to be more active, I think that they have to be really uh, understanding of you know, to what extent they do know about funding and how well they do work for startups specifically, especially uh, because of it, for instance, as you mentioned, there is no uh, early stage uh, financial schemes. Uh, um, so, besides a financing our program, uh, they could be some sort of this, uh, we even talk about this, about this a little bit. Uh, you know, kind, kind of awards for technical uh, services because they're so expensive in Mozambique, you know, like for them to your company, uh, you know the marketing staff, the accounting part, uh, but this has to be really uh, think through. Otherwise, we will not only damage the market, but we will uh, in the sense that you no, know, no, it's free money. If it comes, if it goes, so I'm just getting the money and we'll be okay. But it's also like this is money that's been like a clear loss of visibility of so, uh, what it is. What is what. Um, Adelika, what do you think about Nigeria? Okay, so my question is why the funds are not like market or any other thing? Because the, what do this what do startups that need this funds, what do they need funds for? So that for me is what should be addressed. If I look at Nigeria, quite a lot of startups when from my experience at Facebook, when they're starting up, a lot of the funds required is not really to develop the product or the service. It's really just starting the business and the operations for the that. So what I would say is that donors should look into providing the technical resource capacity that enables the businesses to start or the startups to start in the way that they should. Um, like you said, some of that is in the regulatory requirements of starting up the business or even developing the product and the service. Some of that um, support is from a technical perspective. Some of that is from like financial interest, knowledge and the like. So um, rather than just only cash funds, um, we need to provide the resource and technical support that the startups and the business actually need for the business. Because we can provide the funds, but we don't need to start to build the business um, as required. Thank you very much. Noted. Um, Ismail, what you are again? For me, what they say is very true. For me, uh, 
Come back uh, to you, okay? I wanted to go to him, but I will come to you. So, what do you think? Obviously, taking into account that majority of the startups in developing economies do not really ha or yeah, do not really have that access to it. Hi, so my name is Sumeya, the CEO of Digital Africa. Digital Africa is an initiative that was launched actually by the international leaders of Indotech. And we just launched the operation, we are launching the operation and getting ready for the next investor with two announcements. And among the other announcements are uh, funding structure, early stage for startups. Uh, so connecting all VC funds and all <laughs> many VC funds and different uh, funds towards Africa, towards Africa startups and funding, linking them to the hub and everything that's going on in terms of accounting and etc. I will ask you something. So you've been also to Jungle Lab and you told them here is one million so you can fund your startups and this is great. But if I would give you today a million, would you accept it? And say like, hey, use it for your startup. For the job collapse, yeah? Would you accept it or not? Depends on the budget. I have I'm willing to give a million. million <laughs> Euros. For the startup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the difference. <laughs> 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 uh, would you accept it to give it to the entrepreneurs? Like that, like here, here you go. Bro. I think I would take part to have like technical assistance and uh, part to be uh, to get more exposure to the Yeah. Okay. And you what do you think about this? You know what the thing is. So uh, you think you said technical assistance? Yes. Uh, I think technical assistance is like a big measure uh, which we have in, uh, in the startups. Because when you, when you start a startup, I was the owner of the company working with that. And when you start a startup, start a startup you don't have all the resources and all the skills of the entrepreneur. So I think the measure uh, part of the skills need to be in the We have phones, it's better, but it's not good because... Okay, thank you. You can pass the microphone over there. So Ben, imagine a world where VC funding for Africa is as much available as in the States. Okay? In the United States. So imagine, just imagine. <laughs> it's not possible, right? So it's not possible because the time being, there's, there, there's no financial product that can pay those companies to grow to a level that they will be very attractive or bankable for VCs. It's a very small minority. The investments that are being made in Africa is a fraction of what is being made globally. 
So do you think that governments could pay that gap? Or should they pay that gap? Or is that a responsibility of the African Development Bank or the World Bank or nobody? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. I'll try to get through them real quickly. Cool. One, I would say that there should be more core funding again for hubs because if you have stronger hubs, if, if you have a hub in a tier one city, they're going to be fine, right? They have corporate partners, they can do enough programs, you know, the iHub, uh, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but if you go past hub number 50 and you look at from hub 50 to the hub 400, I think a lot of these hubs would actually benefit from a little bit more core funding support because it would strengthen the base of these hubs that would also allow them to at least have a basic operations that makes them open for business to host events, to run programs, to engage with startups. That's building an ecosystem. But this is also about funding because that also means that your hubs are able to invest in technical capacity to better support entrepreneurs. But how are they going to build for the product developers? How are they going to pay the developers? Well, that's different than startups. I very much agree about the R&D. We should be investing a lot more in prototyping, uh, business challenges, competitions. Uh, all of these things are very useful in terms of uh, getting your entrepreneurs excited, celebrating uh, ideation, celebrating uh, innovation, getting uh, identifying new talents and, and getting them jazzed up to form a team and, and to start the journey of creating a startup. But when you have a startup, you have a team, you have a basic product or service, you're already engaging with customers or clients. As a donor, you don't want to be engaging them with donor money. That's not the right mechanism. And I think if you want to help startups in the earliest stages of their funding cycle, then you could look at uh, uh, co-investing with angel investors, for example. If they and exist. If, and if, you're, if, they, if exist. they exist, but it's also about creating market conditions that will allow them to exist. And governments can definitely do more to create incentives. If they look at their tax legislation, if they look at uh, regulations around how you can bring money into a country or out of a country, all of these things have a direct impact on your private sector's ability to invest in companies. Ladies first, ladies first. I love the heated discussion. So I'm provoking it. That's good. Bridget. So, um, as a fund in South Africa, we have provided funding to startups for seven years or eight years. Um, and uh, in the last, I would say, we learned lessons. I mean, in the early days, we just provided funding. Um, now we provide funding, business support, and um, if the entrepreneur is assigned a mentor, we don't bring them into central hubs. We work with them in their place of business um, because sometimes taking them out of that environment is not good for the business. So I understand, and so I have heard so many arguments to say, oh, you shouldn't give them grant funding, you know, um, at an early stage. It's just sending the wrong message. But I just think. Sorry, but people who say that don't understand the context of where some of these entrepreneurs are coming from. They have, they don't have a formal dwelling, as many of them. They don't, they have, they, they have no collateral against which they could ever get any kind of finance. Um, and they come from backgrounds that are so disadvantaged, many of them. So, I'll give you a silly example. Um, somebody used public transport to transport their goods to market. We, um, uh, it will take them 10 years or longer to save enough money to be able to buy a truck. You buy them a truck, um, just provides this, and, and the rate of growth in that business accelerates so dramatically. So I think when you're trying to accelerate entrepreneurship, um, you, you, you actually need, I think, you need funding Obviously, we don't want that sense of entitlement to develop, but I do think in our, in our context, we've had unbelievable results. We measure everything. And the rate of, of, of turnover growth amongst businesses 
um, has been so dramatic up to 3,000%, simply because the funding is very, very strategic. Um, it's often around patents or things that are going to take that business. Another, another city example, uh, somebody runs a print shop, sorry, runs a print shop and uses a home printer, buy them an industrial printer and so I, I just I, I I have listened in this whole conference to people saying this it should be loans or equity yes. or whatever and um, I I think we've had great results with the grant funding. Yeah. And I'll keep doing it.